Hello friends and welcome to my Bible study class. It is a gorgeous day here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, especially in the morning and even now it's it's been kind of cool and uh, it, it feels as if we're we're about to go into the fall season, okay? And so, uh, and we have blue skies and, uh, you know, the sun's out and the birds are singing and, uh, you know, it's a day where I feel like just going on my porch and just uh, reclining in my chair there and just watch the birds eat the seeds and uh, it, it's such a beautiful day, okay? You don't, f you, you, you feel like just relaxing and not doing anything, okay? So, Welcome to my Sunday school class, and uh, w the title for our class today is Grace and Good Works, okay? Um, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the key verse for our class. The key verse for our class is coming from the book of Titus. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. And I'm reading from the King James Version. But after that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Wow. Okay. And uh, let's look at the same verse in the NIV version. Uh, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's what is meant when somebody says they're born again. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> that they've been, uh, 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 that they have received His, they've been saved. Uh, not because of righteous things that they had done, but because of His mercy. He saved them through the washing of, the, of rebirth. So they've, been, uh, uh, they've received the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means to be born again. Amen? All right. And with that, we're going to go to our worship song. And you all can worship along with me. It's been pre-recorded, okay? to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and give you peace. The Lord bless you, and keep you, make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you, Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face towards you and be gracious unto you. And so, Father, we begin with the blessing, the prayer of blessing on your people, Father. And Father, I pray right now that uh, this entire world is in an absolute turmoil father especially with what is happening in the middle east father and uh, it may just be that we might be on the brink of a world war father but you have not given us a spirit of fear but a power and of love and of a sound mind and so father even in the midst of this turmoil father we have peace through you because you are Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God, our peace. And Father, uh, you, uh, you have told us not to be anxious about anything, but by prayers, with supplications, and with thanksgiving to make our requests known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds by Christ Jesus so we come to you, casting all our cares upon you. For you care so much for us. You promised us you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You'll go with us all the way, even unto the end of the world. Thank you that there's not a sparrow that falls from the tree that you're not aware of. And if you're watching over that little sparrow, and there are billions of them all over the world, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are watching over me. Thank you for peace. Thank you that you have engraved us in the palms of your hand. Thank you that the very hairs on our head are numbered by you. And Father, I come to you right now for my Bible study class I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. And Father, I pray that somebody would hear these words from my mouth and would surrender their lives completely to you because, Father, the way things are going on in this world, Lord, we know beyond the shadow of a death, that uh, the shadow of a doubt that you are coming back soon and very soon. So, Father, I pray a blessing upon your people. And, Father, I pray for the precious anointing of your Holy Spirit to help me to teach your word with clarity. For I ask it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining me uh, and uh, listening to my Bible study. Okay? Uh, Here's what we're going to do. We are going to the introduction of our class, okay? Um, and uh, let's look at the introduction and see, uh, see what this lesson is going to be talking about, okay? All right. Um, just give me one second. And all right. Here we go. God planned to redeem fallen humanity from the beginning. So they became 
his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 and 10, okay? Um, and that's what's written in the book of Ephesians. Um, and uh, I can go to the exact scripture. Uh, in fact, I did read from the scripture, but let's go to the actual scripture itself and see what it's saying. Uh, Ephesians 2 and 10 from the NIV says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hallelujah! Amen? Okay. Um, the nation of Israel's failure to complete the work did not prevent its forward movement. Through Jesus Christ, the church was born and tasked with continuing God's redemptive plan and expectation for the saved to produce good works. Since its birth, the church has withstood varied forms of internal and external opposition aimed to thwart its mission in the world. A significant source of internal opposition is church conflict. It is difficult to state uh, it is difficult to state or measure the far-reaching harmful effects of conflict and divisions on the church's mission of sharing God's love and seeking and saving the lost. At the root of many church conflicts are such problems as pride, spiritual immaturity, carnal or worldly values, ungodly ambition, abuses of power, personality differences, and blurred lines of authority. Aha! Let me repeat that. At the root of any or of many church conflicts are such problems as pride, spiritual immaturity, carnal or worldly values, ungodly ambition, abuses of power, personality differences, and blurred lines of authority. Internal church conflict is not a new phenomenon. The early church faced this challenge particularly from false teachers seeking to contradict the apostles' doctrine and gain their own following. Aha! Such was the case in Crete. Um, uh, this was a Greek city of Crete where troublemakers created controversy threatening the church's doctrinal soundness. In his, um, in his uh, concluding directives to Titus, Paul provided instructions for addressing the situation and confronting those who were responsible for it. Aha! Okay. Now, next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the biblical context. What's the biblical context for our lesson? Paul wrote to Titus with the purpose of advising him in the task of completing the work Paul had begun in Crete, in the church at Crete, and appointing additional leaders to oversee the churches springing up on the island of Crete. Uh, see Titus 1, 5 through 9. So let's go to Titus 1. 5 through 9, and see what that's talking about, okay? And it's talking about appointing elders who love what is good. And so, here's what it says. 
Um, the reason I left you, here's the Apostle Paul writing to Titus, whom he had left behind, in Crete. Uh, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, excuse me, as I directed you. Okay, <clears throat> so as Paul, the senior elder, uh, was was uh, uh, was trying to instruct his junior elder. Okay, uh, now, and uh, here are the qualifications for an elder. Okay, an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe, and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Uh, verse 7, since an overseer, an elder is an overseer, okay? Um, and Paul was an overseer over all the churches uh, in, in Asia Minor, and he had left behind uh, Titus in the Isle of Crete, okay? Now, um, since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Aha! Refute means to correct, okay? Um, all right, so um, that was uh, those scriptures, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. The remainder of the first chapter, see uh, chapter 1, 10 through 16, is devoted to addressing and silencing offenders in the church were deceiving and influencing many to abandon the truth for false teaching. And here this is talking about the Judaizers, okay? Uh, the Judaizers were a, uh, were, were, were a group of uh, Jewish believers who said that uh, it was not sufficient that they believe in Jesus Christ that they had to come under the law. Amen? Uh, law of Moses. They had to obey the law of Moses. And they had to be circumcised to be a true Christian. And that was the biggest problem uh, that Paul and Titus were facing. Okay? Um, uh, and uh, let's, let's see uh, chapter 1 verse... Titus chapter 1, verse 10 through 16. Let's look at what those scriptures are talking about real quick. Uh, rebuking those who fail to do good. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silent. So he's talking about the Judaizers, right? They were insisting that all new Christians had to be circumcised. And had to obey completely the law of Moses, okay? Which was hogwash because it would make the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of no effect, okay? One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons, lazy gluttons. Thus, uh, this saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay uh, no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Aha! And that's what these Judaizers were trying to do. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, Nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. 
verse 16. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not enough to talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. Amen. All right. Um, so uh, let's go on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the remainder of the chapter um, uh, is devoted to addressing and silencing offenders in the church who are deceiving and influencing many to abandon the truth for false teachings. In Titus 2, uh, Titus chapter 2, 1 through chapter 3, verse 11, and we're not going to go there, Paul provides, y'all can look that up, Paul provides instructions regarding how the church functions. He advises Titus on teaching various age groups about living in response to God's grace. Aha! What's God's grace? His unmerited favor. His undeserved favor. We did not deserve it. We cannot earn it. But He gave it to us anyway. Amen? Uh, so you can earn your salvation. You cannot work uh, uh, to be saved. Uh, those things are impossible because it's a free gift of God. Okay? Because of His love for us. Because He loved us so much. He advises Titus on teaching various age groups. Okay. Uh, Paul's final instruction in Titus in chapter 3 outlined an approach to, for teaching believers to demonstrate good works towards government and other believers, as well as how to deal with, with false teachers. Amen? Now, having finished that, let us go to the analysis of the biblical text. And we're going to go to point number one, the motive for godly living. Titus 3, uh, Titus chapter 3, 3 through 8. So, let's go to Titus chapter 3, 3 through 8. Okay, here, the motive for godly living. And uh, all the scriptures are coming from the NIV version. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, okay, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! This is talking about being born again. Okay? The washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Uh, anyone who's a new, he's a new, anyone who's say, uh, who accepts Jesus is a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Uh, let's go on. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 6. Whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen? Uh, Jesus poured out His grace, His unmerited favor, and His mercy uh, uh, on us generously. Uh, in one place it says lavishly uh, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, let's go on. So that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, 
having the hope of eternal life. Hallelujah. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Hallelujah. Um, okay. And so uh, let's, let's uh, dig into these uh, scriptures and kind of see uh, what they're talking about, okay? Um, all right, the motive for godly living, okay? Um, Paul instructed Titus to emphasize godly or right living to the Christians in Crete. The role of grace in achieving, in achieving God's ultimate redemptive purpose Purify a people zealous for good works. Aha! Did you hear that? The whole idea was to purify a people. The whole purpose, the whole redemptive, the ultimate redemptive purpose of God was to purify us, to purify a people zealous for good works. In Titus 3, Paul provided the reason for why Christians are to live godly lives and produce good works. God's grace that brought salvation through Christ. Okay, in verse 3, Paul gives a reminder of believers' sinful condition before God's grace salvaged us. Before grace, the unsaved were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by fleshly passions and pleasures, and characterized by malice, envy, hate, and hating one another. All this changed when God manifested His kindness and love for humanity through Jesus Christ, verse 4. Through His grace, through His unmerited favor, through his undeserved favor, God did for lost souls what we were powerless to do. Aha! Aha! And that's so important to realize. It is impossible for us, for humans, to save themselves from their sins. It's impossible. The Bible clearly says as no one righteousness, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible doesn't say y'all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why the religions of the world are mankind's attempt to reach out to God. But Christianity is essentially not a religion. Christianity is where God reached out to man. Big difference. Hallelujah. Amen. Through His grace, God did for lost souls what we were powerless to do. Amen. God's grace saves those who believe not because of any righteousness in them, but because of His great mercy. Verse 5a. God's kindness, love, and mercy describe the scope of His grace towards us, resulting in our salvation resulting in, we, in us being saved from sin, redeemed from the slave block of sin, bought back from the slave block of sin. Amen? That's what salvation is. His grace accomplished a sin-cleansing new birth and a transforming spirituality by the Holy Spirit 
through Jesus Christ our Savior. Hallelujah! The minute you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes and lives inside of you. When we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, they're three, but they're one. Amen? The third person of the, uh, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, comes and immediately dwells inside of us. And He uh, uh, shows us He's a comforter. He's a teacher. He's the one who, who leads us and guides us and protects us. Uh, and he's the spirit of truth. Amen. Uh, through Jesus' sacrifice for sinners, God has justified believers and guaranteed them the hope of eternal life. Justification means we were declared righteous because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because of the blood that Jesus Christ uh, shed on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Uh. Through Jesus' sacrifice for sinners, God has justified believers and guaranteed them hope of eternal life. Paul charged Titus to emphasize basic Christian doctrines so that God's people would devote themselves to doing good. God's grace is the motivation for godly living. The outworking of that grace is visibly demonstrated by a lifestyle of good spiritual fruit that glorifies God and builds up His church. Hallelujah. Good works and sound doctrine are inseparable because no one can do better without knowing better. It's that simple. You can't do better unless you know better. Sound biblical teaching is essential for developing believers zealous for good works. Let me repeat that. Sound biblical teaching is essential for developing believers Zealous for good works. Hallelujah. What do you think? Given the transformative, sanctification begins at the beginning of the Christian life. How would you minister to a professing Christian who gives no evidence of being any different from a non-Christian? Aha. I would tell them, my friend, you need to be born again. What's born of the flesh is flesh, but what's born of the Spirit is spirit. You have to be born from above. You have to be born by the Holy Spirit of God. Born again. Amen? Uh, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things are swept away. All things have become new. Okay? All, all things have passed away. All things have become new. Amen? And, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you know, you must be born again. Okay? That's what I tell them. And I'd also tell them that you can't walk with God and play footsie with the devil. Oh, God, help us. Help your people, Lord. You can hold the hand of God and then play footsie with the devil at the same time. Amen? You have to be born again. You must be born again. Okay. All right. Now, point number two, how to handle troublemakers. Titus 3, 9 through 11. So, let's go to Titus 3, uh, uh, 9 through 11. Okay. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. 
Amen? You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Hallelujah. Okay, let's, let's dig into these scriptures and see what they're talking about, okay? Um, all right. Titus chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. Historically, the church had been troubled by those who caused division. In the closing section of the epistle, Paul gives helpful instructions on how to deal effectively with false teachers. Unfortunately, some in the church, churches on the island of Crete taught things that were harmful to these believers. These were mainly Judaizers, like I explained earlier. Without giving specific details of the erroneous teachings that were disrupting the church, Paul in verse 9 refers to foolish controversies, genealogies, and arguments, and quarrels about the law. You know, sometimes people love to split hairs over stupid little things. Therefore, some conclude that these false teachers were Judaizers, Jews who promoted imaginary stories about their ancestors recorded in Old Testament genealogies. Additionally, it appears that they were giving incorrect interpretation and application to the tenets of the law, arguing, quarreling among themselves, and influencing others to embrace their teachings. Aha! Uh, and the main teachings of the Judaizers were circumcision, that even if you were saved as a Christian, you had to be circumcised. And the other thing was you had to keep the entire law with the 613 commandments. Can you believe that? Wow. <laughs> Forget about the 10, but they came up with 613 different commandments, okay? <laughs> ah, amazing. <laughs> um, Second, Titus was to deal with these troublemakers decisively. They had to be silenced and prevented from spreading their false teachings. Sometimes false teaching is so destructive it has to be stopped. In this case, the Judaizers had to be stopped because they were making the cross of none effect. Uh, you know, we're saved because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And all our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. We're not under the law now. We're under grace. Amen? Um, finally, Paul explained that refusal to repent would prove uh, that they were corrupt, sinful, and self-condemned. These instructions are still relevant for the churches today. When doctrinal error is introduced into the church, some recognize it for what it is. Others may unknowingly embrace it. When this occurs... Church leaders must follow Paul's directives by warning the perpetrators, prohibiting their teaching, and disciplining them with disassociation unless they show genuine repentance. There is dual responsibility and accountability inherent in Paul's instructions. First, church leaders must know the importance of sound biblical doctrine to spiritual growth and purity. The church must prioritize teaching accurate biblical truth. See uh, Timothy 2 and 15. So that believers can discern truth from error. Second, the church must train and warn believers to discern the difference between error and truth. Amen. Okay, let's go on. What do you think? Why is church discipline necessary at times? Why must the church not avoid such confrontation when it is required? That's an excellent question. Uh, many times, uh, pastors uh, are so burdened down with the, the affairs of the church that they do not uh, have time to attend to these um, uh, little squabbles that sometimes can erupt. Amen? 
Um, and so, but they have to take the time uh, to confront situations like that uh, and, and uh, rebuke people if necessary. Amen? Uh, for, the, for the case of soundness of teaching in the church. Amen? Okay, here's a closing thought. Paul's final instructions to Titus were to teach Cretan believers to follow good works and deal with those creating controversy and division among them. These principles are still relevant. First, all believers must embrace a lifestyle that produces righteousness, righteousness works because of God's gracious salvation and its inherent blessings of a new beginning which is regeneration, a new legal standing, justification, and a new future, which is glorification. Second, church leaders must guard against pointless controversies and erroneous teachings and maintain focus on God's saving work in Christ and the hope of eternal life. They must deal decisively with those causing conflict and controversy by silencing them, dismissing those who refuse repentance and rest restoring those who show evidence of repentance. Salvation is inseparable from good works. God expects every believer to embrace a lifestyle of doing good as evidence of their salvation. Amen? Uh, good works will not save you, but if you are saved, you will produce good works as evidence of your salvation. It's that simple. Consider your responses to the following questions as you challenge to grow in grace. Uh, as you challenge to grow in grace, how could your life in Christ differ if you renewed your commitment to doing the good works that God created and called you to accomplish? What changes will you need to make? What spiritual disciplines do you need to practice to accomplish God's work? Hallelujah. These are such excellent questions. I want you to think about, okay? Okay? Um, remember in one of the letters of, the, of uh, Revelation, he said, uh, do your first works over again. What you did when you after you first got saved. Amen? I think it was to the uh, Ephesian church, if I'm not mistaken. All right? Paul's instruction to, if I remember uh, accurately, Paul's instructions to Titus touch on an uncomfortable topic in church, discipline, the need to preserve sound biblical doctrine and preserve the church's witness before the world is more urgent than ever. Church leaders must not overcome, overlook the benefit and purpose of church discipline. Restoration rather than punitive dismissal. And, and the goal should always be to, be to restore the brother, not to kick him out. Amen? The church cannot afford to let erroneous teaching and misinterpretations of God's word infiltrate believers and become a divisive issue. Therefore, believers must stand united on the truth and follow the biblical pattern for dealing decisively and appropriately with controversy and conflict. The goal is to correct the error and restore the perpetrators in faith. See Titus 1 and 13. Okay, here's our closing prayer. Dear God, thank you for saving us by your grace so that we can embrace a lifestyle of doing good for your glory Help us to allow nothing to distract us from accomplishing the good works that we do in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. And with that, we come to the finish of our, uh, le uh, of our lesson. And we'll finish with our worship song. So worship belongs to you.
May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Thank you for listening. And if you like the broadcast, please put likes on it. And please share it with, uh, uh, with everyone, okay? And uh, if, you, if you can take the time in the comment section... To, to mention where you're watching, the city and the country you're watching from. I would really, really, truly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. God bless you.